Do you support privatizing Medicare and Social Security? Explain your answer. Ms. Slotkin. Sure. That's an easy one. No. Uh, uh, I think that if you worked your entire life um, and invested in our system, you deserve Social Security and Medicare and the benefits that were promised. And I believe that attempting to privatize Social Security and Medicare are ways to creep at that service that we've earned our whole lives. So I don't believe in privatizing them, um, nor do I believe in privatizing the VA. It happened to be on military insurance. So it's the same answer to the same question. Um, no. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you support privatizing Medicare and Social Security? Explain your answer. No. Uh, as someone who studied and taught public policy for more than 30 years, uh, I'm pretty much a critic of privatizing anything that ought to be essential as a government function. Uh, and as an advocate of Medicare for All to make sure that all Americans have guaranteed access to health care, uh, that is the opposite of privatization. That's a way to get everybody covered without having extraneous costs leak out by people who are seeking to profit uh, when Americans' health is at stake. Okay, thank you. Our next question, what one piece of legislation do you think would best reduce gun violence, Ms. Slotkin. Yeah, so I grew up in a gun owning family, um, grew up on a farm, I was trained in both a Glock and an M4 when I was on my three tours in Iraq, and my husband's a career army officer, so he carried a weapon every day that he was deployed. So I'm a believer in the Second Amendment, but it is because of that background and because of that training that I believe we need to have a real conversation, an honest conversation about gun safety. Um, and for me, the piece of legislation that would be most effective, most pressingly, is to focus on the things where we have common ground. And that, to me, is universal background checks and closing all loopholes. That would make an immediate difference. In addition, anything that turns any weapon into a fully automatic weapon, bump stocks, extended magazines, should not be sold, um, and raising the age for certain firearms. I think those are things that are practical, and I think people with experience with weapons are actually in the best position to lead this conversation. Okay. What one piece of legislation do you think would best reduce gun violence, Mr. Smith? If you look at my website, you can see that there's an entire list of things that I advocate, including end the sale of military style rifles to the public. But if you're going to focus on one thing that might have an effect, it is to remove the shield that gun manufacturers and sellers currently enjoy against liability lawsuits. Because we know from the history of law that the ability to file lawsuits for personal injuries and harms is the mechanism through which we have increased the safety of all kinds of devices in society. We have the technological capability to create smart weapons that can only be fired by certain people with certain you know, uh, codes or what have you. And the way to pressure manufacturers and sellers to have safer items is to have greater freedom for their e-lawsuits, and they enjoy a special protection right now that has harmed our society. Okay, thank you. What legislation would you propose to address the current issues at our border? Ms. Slotkin. Yeah. Um, so I think, as we've all just seen in the past couple of weeks with the separation of families, it is a symptom of an immigration system fundamentally working. It's not working for anyone. It's not working for workers. It's not working for our DACA kids who deserve a package of citizenship. It's not working for our farmers who depend on temporary labor. It's not working for anybody. Um, and so we need comprehensive immigration reform, and that means comprehensive. That means something that does strengthen our borders where necessary, that does key to our economy and the jobs and the professions that we need here. Um, we need something that provides a pathway of citizenship for those DACA kids, and then we need something that holds companies accountable when they use undocumented labor. Um, and that's what I would propose, and I hope very much to see uh, implemented in the next couple of months if possible. Okay. Uh, what legislation would you propose to address the current issues that are border, Mr. Smith? Well, one of the things about the border is that we sort of need to return to our current legal principles where we respect the concept of asylum, where we will agree to let people come here who are fleeing violence, 
We take a strong line about keeping families together. And we also have to recognize, when you have a country with freedom and economic opportunity, people will try to come. I think the first thing that we need to do to approach this is to return to our commitment to science and research. We need to comprehensively study why American employers hire people who enter the country illegally. And as part of these studies, we also need to explore what if we raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Would that lead Americans to go to those locations and to take those jobs where there are currently claims that Americans do not want uh, uh, that employment? And to get a comprehensive picture of why we have the employment situation we do okay. is the first step. Thank you. That time has expired. The next question. What trade policies would you support with our worldwide allies and neighbors, Canada and Mexico? This slide. Yeah, so I think we need to take a principled approach to trade. And I think that's something we haven't always done. Uh, and a principled approach means every trade deal that we're looking at, either renegotiating or negotiating in the future, a new deal, needs to check the box on a couple of things. What does it do concretely for American workers? Is it gonna take away jobs or increase jobs? What does it do for the human rights and working standards for people in other countries? Is it gonna be, are they gonna be held to the same standards or are they gonna be allowed to get away with a lesser standard? Um, and what does it do in our global economy, our position in the global economy? All those things need to be looked at when we're signing trade deals or renegotiating trade deals. And that's what I would do if elected to Congress is take that principled approach. I would not um, engage in a trade war. And I think while we all understand um, what's going on right now, the sentiment behind it, that China is in particular not playing by the rules of the global system, getting us engaged in a trade war is not the way to handle that. And the proof's gonna be in the pudding. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, what trade policies would you support with our worldwide allies and neighbors of Canada and Mexico? Well, we can see what happens when you do tariff policy by Twitter. And we see right now a willingness apparently in Washington to sacrifice auto workers and farmers under this theory that trade wars are easy to win. The reality is we have to be engaged with the international community. It's inevitable. But two things I think we can do as we go back and re-examine agreements. Uh, one is to make sure that labor has a voice at the table in these negotiations. Because it seems to me that's the way to make sure we get fairness to American workers and we also impose standards elsewhere in the world. Secondly, we have to have a commitment from the start to recognize there are regional and industry winners and losers in trade deals. And as a country, we have to say, we are gonna to commit to invest in economic development in those regions and industries that lose something in trade deals. Okay, our next question. Should the federal government intervene in the student debt issue? Explain your response. The we'll slide. Sure, I think uh, the situation we have right now, particularly this district has Michigan State in it, um, we are saddling the next generation with crippling debt. So I do believe the federal government has a role. The federal government could say tomorrow if they wanted that student loan rates are capped at 2.5%. That right there would have a dramatic impact on how much our kids are racking up in debt. And then if you've already paid, your, you've already gone through school and you're still struggling with debt, you can renegotiate your loan at 2.5%. Um, the other thing the federal government can do is increase Pell Grants. Right? The amount of money we have that are going to our kids in order to make sure they get the education they need. And then lastly, we have tons of jobs right now in our state that are vacant. Um, and we have tons of kids wanting to go into the best well-paid jobs they can get their hands on. We need to incentivize the jobs that are available today, IT, coding, cybersecurity, so that kids can earn while they learn in order to go into the fields with the best pay and opportunity. All right. Should the federal government intervene? Our final question uh, for the candidates tonight. Uh, what more should the federal government be doing to protect the nation against cyber attacks? Ms. Slotkin. Sure, well, uh, I spent my career in national security. I was 14 years in the CIA, Pentagon, um, and so I've spent my life ever since 9-11 working on preventing attacks on US forces and on the US homeland. So this one is personal to me. Um, I think uh, there's a couple things we can do. First of all, we have to invest in preventing the, the threats of the 21st century. We've become very good at preventing the threats of the 20th century, but the threats of the 21st century are fundamentally different. 
Um, and right now, while this administration has invested heavily um, in the Defense Department, uh, they haven't necessarily um, done right by the state. They've actually cut some of the state budgets for Homeland Security, including cyber security protection and protection of our critical infrastructure. So for me, I would play, I believe, an important kind of oversight role in making sure that we are investing in the technologies of warfare today, not warfare of yesterday. Okay. What more should the federal government be doing to protect the nation against cyber attacks, Mr. Smith? And Part of it relates to education uh, and investing in higher education in those areas of greatest need and uh, emerging issues. But the other piece, quite frankly, that faces us right now uh, is we have one political party that is in denial about what the Russians did in our last elections. And they are in conflict with all the intelligence agencies in trying to protect the president. Uh, we need to wake up and address that, or we're going to have kinds of cyber attacks in the very near future that are going to impact our ability to run a democracy. So part of it is technology, part of it is investing, but part of it is convincing people to get their heads out of the sand about what's already happened to us and stop being in denial about this so that we, as a unified country, can address it treat the Russians as the adversary that they are. Okay, thank you. All right, now we'll move on to our uh, closing statements to each candidate giving you two minutes each. We'll start with this slide. Sure. Um, thank you to our moderators. Thank you for the organizers, for everyone who came out. Um, this kind of back and forth is actually a really healthy part of the democratic process and not something that's happening enough in Washington, so I'm glad um, we're doing it here on the ground. Um, I am running because I believe that we cannot change Congress unless we change who we send to serve them. I think we need a new generation of leaders who think differently, who work harder, and who never forget that they are public servants. And I think many of our representatives have forgotten that they are fundamentally public servants first. I've spent my career in national security. Uh, and in national security, you focus on the mission. You get to work. You bear down, you get people from disparate sides of the room and on, on disparate sides of the issue to get together, you hammer out a solution, and you act. And it's that same kind of mission focus that I want to bring to representing this district. Um, I think that I will do that by focusing on the things that really matter to people. Bringing down the cost of healthcare and prescription drugs. Doing a once in a generation investment in our infrastructure and curbing the influence of money in politics. I also commit to listening. We do not have enough listening in our system right now. We certainly have a representative in this district who has forgotten that listening is a fundamental part of representing people in Washington. I'm extremely proud of the campaign that we have built in the past year. We have 1,000 volunteers. We've had over 100 public events. Half of our volunteers have never done anything political in their lives, and they come from across the political spectrum. I am very proud of that. Um, I hope very much to earn your vote on August 7th. Um, thank you for being engaged citizens. It is part of service to your community, service to the country we all love, and I do believe really, really appreciate it. And now a closing statement from Chris I will let me reiterate my thanks. This is really the best part of campaigning to have some interaction uh, with people and be able to talk so that people really hear what you have to say. Uh, professionally, I've taught public policy and law for more than 30 years at various state universities, past 24 years at uh, MSU, the author of several dozen books on public policy and law. Never thought I would run for office, but on a certain night in November 2016, I saw a crisis had arrived and I needed to do more for my country. And I felt that this is what I was prepared to do, especially because no Republican should go unchallenged to Congress today. I grew up in Michigan in a union household. I'm a product of Michigan Public Schools. I have deep roots in this district. As I set about campaigning, or decided how to campaign, we made some decisions about how we were going to be different. We were going to be straightforward and forthright about everything. 
Ask any question you want. I'll tell you just what I think, even if I know it's not what you want to hear. I had issue positions up on my website before I was even running. Because I'm a policy voter, and I think other people are interested in policies as well. And that's why I've staked out some pretty strong positions. Medicare for all, stop sales of military-style rifles, no pipelines under the Great Lakes. I hope you'll go to my website um, and look at the list. The other thing that we did is there's a lot of talk about resisting the power of money in politics. And we decided we weren't going to be part of the big money chase. We need enough money to do what we need to do. But we have not asked any PACs for money. We have not attended any PAC-sponsored fundraising events. Our idea is that we want politics to be different. We have to have candidates who start living it differently by being straightforward, not planning for a career in Congress. Okay, thank you. Thank you.